Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's a privilege um, to follow the Honourable Lady's contribution just now that brought into such acute uh, awareness exactly the sort of situation that families across the world are facing as Iran continues to industrialise um, the taking of hostages. Um, I'd also like to thank my friend uh, for Harawith for securing this debate, uh, because we know throughout this House that we've all been very passionate about raising our voices for those who the Iranian regime is trying to silence. And it has been almost five months now since an Iranian Kurdish woman was arrested, uh, severely beaten, and later died in custody. Masa Amini is a symbol for what so many women around the fa world face and for what women across Iran have faced for too long, which is denial of their basic rights, subjugation, and the suggestion they do not deserve to be treated as even the most basic of human individuals that they are lesser, that they have no rights and that anything can happen to them and that men have the right to dole out punishments that they see fit for their own joy and their own fulfilment because that is what this is, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is misogynism entrenched within an institution, within a government. It is the taking of joy in violence against women because we are lesser. And this is something we see across the world and something that we have to raise our voices against. And we in Britain can be a leading voice on this. The, her tragic and needless death has shown the enormous courage of the Iranian people. And it has reminded us of just how repressive this regime is. As we speak, the regime in Tehran continues to act with brazen disregard for life and humanity, whether it be state murders, whether it be violence on the streets of Iran, or whether it be the rape of virgins who are arrested for not wearing the headscarves enough and who are being told, you will now go to Allah sullied as you deserve to be. This is what is happening within Iranian prisons. And yet we have not sanctioned all of the prison guards within Evin Prison. We have sanctioned former guards who are not there perpetrating the current crimes taking place, but not those within the prison now. And that is something that I would ask the Minister to urgently look at, because it is something that we can change and do overnight. The case of the British-Iranian dual national, Ali Reza Akbari, has also been raised. Last night we all heard that he was sentenced to death, and like all those who have spoken earlier, I hope that he is still alive and that can be changed. But the issue here is that Iran does not recognise British-Iranian dual nationals. Now, there are two questions as to why, he has been, uh, why his death sentence has been brought forward. He's been held for a long time. That is a traditional tactic of the Iranian regime, to hold people ready for when they need to use them. That is because the Iranians are sanctioned, as they should be, because they have very left, few cards left to play. So they hold our British nationals in prisons until they need to use them. So the question is, is the Iranian regime bringing forward this death sentence now? because they want to prove their point that it is not the Iranian people rising up organically against a cruel and evil and repressive regime, but that it is the UK and the US and the West and the Israelis and all those awful people that are rising up and forcing a fake revolution within that country. So they could be doing it to make that point. They could also be doing it because this individual used to be a deputy defence minister and the individual for whom he was the deputy is now head of the, uh, he's general secretary general of the National Security Council of Iran. Now that individual has been the most moderate voice within the Iranian regime over the last few months, has been the most likely to call for moderate response, moderate behaviour and for dialogue. Is this a warning to him? We don't know. But either way, the result is the same, which is this individual, this British Iranian national, is being used as a hostage to negotiate and to get the Iranian what they need and the headlines that they need domestically, and it is absolutely wrong. And I echo the Foreign Secretary's statement that if Iran does not halt this, that there must be consequences. If he is killed, there must be sanctions. We must consider expelling the charge d'affaires here in, Iran, uh, in London, and we must consider recalling our ambassador. And I would ask the Minister, it would be helpful to receive an update on what progress our ambassador believes he is making in Tehran. Because I understand that more often than not, that it is better to keep someone on the ground for the small conversations that can take place, for the small support of civil society that can be provided, for the negotiations that need to take place and for understanding the dynamics of what's really going on. But I question whether we have seen meaningful results from our embassy in Tehran over the last five months. And that is not a criticism of our ambassador and our diplomatic staff there, because what they are doing is impossible. But if they can have no meaningful effect, remaining there sends a message that we support continued relationship with the Iranian regime. And we have to question whether that is a message that we wish to send.
Now, on the point about detaining hostages, this is something that Iran is doing en masse. There are 66 foreign dual nationals that have been detained since 2010, 15 of which have definite links to the UK. We owe it to Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, to the Ashouri family, to end the Iranian regime's bartering of human lives. And for that, we need to decide whether we need a special envoy for hostage taking or whether we need a multilateral response in some way working with the Canadians under their leadership. And that is why the Foreign Affairs Committee is doing an inquiry into state hostage taking. And I hope the results will be listened to carefully by the government. Now, it is clear that those responsible must be sanctioned. And while the regime continues to repress people, within Iran, we must also look at their activities within the UK and the West and how that impacts on us. We heard last year from the head of MI5 that Iran has plotted the assassination and kidnapping of at least 10 British residents and has crossed over into launching terrorist attacks on British soil if they can. They have undertaken more assassinations in Western Europe in the last five years than any other country. And as my right honourable friend over there pointed out, um, we have the point that they are also intimidating British journalists. That is utterly unacceptable. So that then comes down to how we make ourselves more resilient to the Iranian state, and that is where the discussion of prescribing uh, comes into play. Now, this is by no means a straightforward uh, conversation, um, and I'd like to reflect on some advice that was given by Jonathan Hall, uh, the government's terrorism advisor on this state, because there are challenges to prescribing the IRGC. I don't suggest it's easy, but they are not insurmountable. It all comes down to the application of the Terrorism Act 2000. So modern states have been responsible for the most lethal uh, instances of terrorism. We know that from the Jacobins. Uh, it was first used around the French Revolution. Terrorism is a tactic that we know states use, and it is the most devastating form of action when states pursue terrorism. The enduring policy of the UK government is to treat terrorism by states as falling outside of the Terrorism Act 2000. But this appears to be a policy position rather than an interpretation of the Act, which is what I would suggest gives us some room for manoeuvre. The best illustration being the Salisbury attack by Russia in March 2018, uh, where my honourable friend for Maidenhead was incredibly strong in her response, but the government was scrupulous in using it as hostile state activity and no counter-terrorism powers were used at all. Um, there is no authoritative ruling by the courts on whether state terrorism can be included within the Terrorism Act, but the High Court in 2006 did suggest that words taken by themselves were broad enough to cover all lawful acts of war, but it was a misconception of definition for acts by some states to fall within it. So the effect of prescribing the IRGC would be to accept that contrary to our long-standing policy position, that state forces and therefore states can be concerned in terrorism within the Terrorism Act 2000. Now that requires great consideration because essentially we have to bring within that proposition that when a state force uses or threatens violence, they normally comply with the laws of, law, laws, um, laws of war, known as the international humanitarian law, and that we therefore have to say that the activities of the IRGC fall outside of that definition, and that such activity therefore falls outside the definition of terrorism. Now, I suggest that the House is probably united in believing that the IRGC's actions does fall out of international humanitarian law. So it follows, therefore, that if the IRGC were prescribed on the basis that its violence amounts to terrorism, the argument would be that acts of violence carried out by friendly state forces, uh, any European partner could be named, and not terrorism because they do and are carried out in accordance with international humanitarian law. So my argument would be that I recognise that ministers may be receiving all sorts of complex legal guidance from civil servants, but it has been a policy decision, not a legal decision so far not to prescribe. And although there are profound implications to this decision, state forces are capable of being concerned in terrorism. And so the question is more how the definition of terrorism applies to other state forces. We will have to address that at the risk of upsetting the meaning of terrorism in domestic law, but I would argue it is absolutely the right thing to do. And so I hope that sets out that while there are many reasons to say it is insurmountable to prescribe, it is actually achievable. Um, I wish to finish, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, by talking about the UK's commitment to the JCPOA. Um, for all intents and purposes, it has failed to deter Iran in any meaningful way. Um, they have enriched uranium, they are progressing their development of nuclear weapons. All it now falls essentially for them to do is to work out how to put the uranium into a mobile weapon system that they can therefore move and deploy, which is not easy, but they have come a long way in their progress. And that is because progress is frozen and you might as well say the JCPOA is dead. Now, I get quite frustrated when I hear politicians say that JCPOA is dead, because my question then is, well, what do we do next? In what way is it dead? Where do we go from here? And that's one of the challenges. 
So if the JCPOA is dead, then, the Brit then Britain has to seize the initiative with our allies and come up with a new format that rightly calls out human rights abuses alongside nuclear proliferation and make sure that we find a new way forward. But the system currently is not working. There is also an additional problem that whilst the government helpfully confirmed over Christmas that the IRGC is sanctioned its entirety, it is only sanctioned within the context of the JCPOA, and that expires in October, which means that from October the IRGC will no longer be sanctioned in British law. And there I would suggest, given the length of time it takes to do sanctions, that we need to start action now, Mr Deputy Speaker, if we are to make sure that in October we do not end up with the IRGC no longer being sanctioned by the British Government. Um, very briefly, I will also point out that when we look at why the IRGC is a terrorist organisation, we should not forget their activities in their immediate region. In Iraq, we have Iranian militia committing massacres against religious minorities, uh, ostracising communities, threatening politicians and making Iraqi politics inherently unstable. In Syria, the Iranian regime has allowed the country to become a drug superstate, and this is something that I would urge all members to start to look at. The Assad regime is a heinous regime, and I spent years of my life watching and looking at the images and photos of those people that Assad, President Assad paid a photographer to take photos of the people who were tortured and killed in his prisons because he wanted evidence that his wishes were being carried out. Now, I spent two and a half years of my career having to look through all of those, and I will never forget them. I will never forget meeting the women who were forced to watch their husbands be raped in prisons until they gave up whatever their husband knew or did not know, but were supposedly part of the opposition. The Iranian regime is part of the reason why Assad is still in power, and no, it was never the intention of the government to bring down Assad. I never heard that sentence uttered once in my time working there. But did we think that he could not bring peace or stability or freedom to people of <coughs> Syria? Absolutely. But Iran has now turned Syria into a drug superstate. Category A drugs, especially things like fentanyl, are being produced en masse. Those will make their way to British shores. They may only be in Lebanon and Jordan and Israel and neighbouring countries at the moment. They will come to Britain if we do not recognise that our Indo-Pacific tilt cannot mean that we forget the Middle East. We have historic commitments and promises that we have made to those communities. And our recent recommendations for the review of the integrated review from the Foreign Affairs Committee makes clear that the Middle East has to be a priority. In Lebanon, they are destabilising en masse. We now have cholera outbreaks and all sorts of appalling fragilities in that country that shouldn't be there. And Hezbollah and Hamas continue to be stood up by Iran. So I would argue, Mr Deputy Speaker, that Iran is a terrorist regime, whether it be their activities at home, whether it be their activities in Europe, their activities in the UK, or their activities in their region, and we have to take action. But President Obama's greatest regret from his time as president was not standing up for the Green Revolution and for listening to his civil servants when they said, if you raise your voice to the protesters, it gives the Iranian regime more evidence that this is an American plot. We cannot listen to that advice again. We must heed his warning, and that is why we need uh, sanctions after every single state murder, why we must consider recalling our ambassador, we must reconsider whether or not we are having any meaningful impact in Iran, and we must make sure we look at a new international multilateral effort to prevent nuclear war coming to the Middle East and allowing this terrorist state to get those powers. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you.